We're looking back once again at 2023, our greatest hits and our biggest whiffs, biggest misses from the 2023 season. Adam, Dave, Heath, Jamie here with you on Wednesday afternoon. You know, it's Wednesday. It's our fun. It's our fun day. Wednesday's fun. Happy fun day, everybody. Yeah. Fun day. It's the first time you and Heath are back together, right? Back to yep. First time. Time yeah. heals all wounds. I've <laughs> served, served my suspension and uh, allowed back on the show again now. That's right. Wait, so, so we had Emery on Sunday, and then you had Dynasty on Tuesday, right? right. And so you felt, you felt okay, that's enough time of waiting at him. And then a lot of people were like, that. my wife does the same thing. I haven't seen her in four days. So I don't blame you. Uh, well, don't on, check your you mail. In, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm walking in the field in Mobile, and a, and a fantasy analyst who listens to our show, he's going to go nameless, uh, <laughs> comes to me and says, what the hell happened between Adam and Heath? <laughs> And I, I, you know, I love you guys. I love being on the show. I don't listen. Uh, I don't listen back to it when I'm on. I don't listen to it when I'm not on. But I did this time. And wow, you two. Wow. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. And I, I, I'll just say it. I didn't think anything about it. Like the show got over and I was not mad at Adam at all. I didn't like we've had. So many yelling matches in the I last know. nine years. Adam has called me an idiot moron and a loser. He screamed that he hated me. Like, I thought this was just kind of a, a regular thing. Loser. Yeah, I, <laughs> but, loser. Uh, yeah. I was back. I, I, I do not. Uh, nothing happened. Yeah, it was a normal day. Um, all right. Anyway, uh, I got three quick questions for you before we get into the show. Uh, one, we're going to talk about Alexander Madison today as a, as a whiff. Who was, he had 180 carries without a touchdown. Who was the last running back to have at least 180 carries and no rushing touchdowns? Oh. Mm. Went Are we Kyle Sanders have a year where he didn't score? Uh, let me check how many carries he had, but I don't think it was that many. Now I'm making. Now I feel like I was wrong. No, he had a uh, 137 carries without a touchdown. He was the uh, other guy that fits in the Alexander Madison category of what I was most wrong about. So that's right. How so again, uh, within the last 10 years, it was his guy's rookie season, and he went on to have a very good career. <sighs> you got it. Come on, you got it. I, no, not the last 10 years. It was Melvin Gordon, wasn't it? Nine years ago. Nine years ago. Okay. Wow, that seems like it was longer than nine years ago. Melvin Gordon, 2015, I believe it was. 184 carries without a rushing touchdown. Alexander Madison had 180. Okay, next question. This is a Greatest Hits show. What's your favorite Greatest Hits album? What was that called? I had a, a – I don't know if it counts, but like when I was in high school, I had a, a Zeppelin remastered set. And it was uh, three di three discs, and I I wore those out. So I think that has to probably be it. But that does that make it your favorite or just the one that you listen to the most? Because I've got one that I listened to the most in college, but I don't know if if it's my favorite. It's the Doors. I mean, my favorite this week has to be Taylor Swift, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does she have a greatest hits album yet? So, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, no, I don't know if she, if she, if she made one. I mean, obviously, she has enough. Is there a, a greatest hits album by Taylor Swift? Yeah, I guess there is. I don't know. Not every, not every artist has, but different times of their career, they make a greatest hits album. All right. The Doors for Dave. What was your favorite, Dave? I don't know if I've got a favorite greatest hits album. Okay. All right. Jamie, how about you? Uh, that I listen to the most? Either one. Or your I'll favorite? Probably, I'll, I'll go uh, BC Boys. License still. Well, but that's not a greatest hit album. That's it's just like a compilation album. album. Yeah, like, oh, like okay. me, Brian Adams' greatest. Like, hit. there's no chance The Doors' greatest hits is going to be my favorite album of all time. That's terrible. I think the, Brian Adams so far so good, Dave. Remember that one? That was a, like I a, remember, a, I, a. I know you love that one. I, I, I think the interesting thing was like I answered Zeppelin, Dave answered The Doors. Jamie answered Beastie Boys, and Adam may have tweeted negative things about all three of them <laughs> in the past. <laughs> right. Yes, he's not yes. A Beastie like any of them. <laughs> the answer for me would have been U2's greatest hits, by the way. All right, and then the last one, one. I'm having trouble with the, with this one here. Are you guys good with barbecue at a Super Bowl party? 
if I order barbecue. Is that better than your arts and farts? Yeah, right. <laughs> Do you try to build the plate out of like tin foil and popsicle sticks first. Not I get my party. Barbecue? That was a different person's party. I usually yeah. it's wings, you know, maybe it's pizza. I'm thinking barbecue. What's wrong with the barbecue? All right. Yeah, it's just a, I think it's a little unconventional I, for Super Bowl. I don't know. If it's I good enough, smoked, smoked meat for, for the last like off. seven barbecues or Super Bowls. So no, you're doing it yourself. I'm catering. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, all right. Uh, FFT Dynasty, please check that out. What do we have? Uh, what do we have yesterday? What do we have coming up on FFT Dynasty? Wait, a couple guys from the Underdogs, Chalk and Scott Belanger. We talked about the art of Dynasty and something I think that we'll get into a little bit later when we talk about Tank Dell, but the anatomy of um, kind of looking at like what do the best players at each position, what what attributes do they share, and how that's changed over the last few years. All right. Make sure you listen to it every Tuesday. You can watch it on YouTube right here on youtube.com slash fantasy football today. Um, obviously, you can watch it anytime on demand or just download the podcast fantasy football today dynasty. Subscribe to it. We have a mailbag tomorrow. You have time to get your questions in fantasy football at cbsi.com. That's the letter I fantasy football at cbsi.com. Let's do some news and notes real quick. Andy Reid appears to be set to return next season, kind of brushing off retirement talk. Uh, but Jarek McKinnon and Joe Tooney, starting offensive guard, unlikely to play, it seems. Tampa Bay center Ryan Jensen retired. He's played only one game over the last two seasons. So sorry to see uh, that he'll be retiring. Obviously, just health issues for him. Stefan Diggs, you know, the, the Bills talked about having Stefan Diggs back. He said, can't tell what the future holds. He did not really commit it's not necessarily his decision but he did not necessarily seem to think he'd be back in, in buffalo Are you talking about his answer at the pro bowl from the nfl network it was a i don't know who he was talking to but it was a long-winded that long yeah. it was just like a kind of repetitive i don't know we'll see what the future yeah, holds. The, the, he, probably i think it's the only time he talked at the pro bowl so um yes it was very non-committal right levy on bell though wants to return and he wants to play for the steelers all right good luck Arthur Smith could use him. And uh, John Harbaugh spoke highly of Rashad Bateman, says he'll be a starter in 2024. The Packers plan to sign Jordan Love to an extension, and uh, they expect to have Aaron Jones back in 2024. And then we got a lot of offensive coordinator hires recently. I, I asked Jamie about Cliff Kingsbury yesterday, but we have him going to Washington. We have former Browns coordinator Alex Van Pelt going to the Patriots. Greg Roman being hired as the coordinator for the Chargers. Um, Nick Holtz, which, who was the passing game coordinator for Jacksonville. He's uh, the Titans offensive coordinator, but Brian Callahan, the new head coach, he's going to call plays. Uh, Clint Kubiak of the 49ers is expected to be the, the Saints' new offensive coordinator. The Raiders hired Luke Getze, who was the former Bears offensive coordinator. Dave, is there one or two that really stand out as big-time fantasy significance here? I like the Kubiak hire. I'm just a little bit nervous about how how long he'll be there or how big of an impact he'll make because that coaching staff feels set up for a lame duck year where they just they're if they don't make the playoffs, they're all gone. But it is the same type of offense that Derek Carr has thrived in before. And I'm at least a little bit hopeful that it could lead to some good things for the Saints offense. I am kind of a Luke Getze fan. Two years ago, he was an absolute master of scheming up in the red zone. Curious to see what quarterback will be in Las Vegas with Getze and whether or not he'll be able to have that kind of success. Remember, not last year's success in Chicago, but two years ago uh, with the Raiders. I think he has something to say about Greg Roman. I, well, I don't really I, – I mostly think thought when you read through that list, it was not very inspiring. No, like these were not are not guys. Now Kubiak has been a part of a very successful offense, and maybe Luke Getzey did some good things in Chicago, but like it wasn't like it was one of the best offenses in the NFL. I remember Jamie and Pete talking a lot this season about the the passing game concepts for the Jacksonville Jaguars and, and the the right ways they were holding Trevor Lawrence back. And now their passing game coordinator is going to be an offensive coordinator, but none of them were were more disturbing to me than the idea of Justin Herbert with Greg Roman. Um, we've talked about already with the Harbaugh hire, how he's been really run heavy. Roman has been a coordinator in the NFL for 10 NFL seasons. All 10 of those seasons, his team ranked in the top nine in rush attempts. 
and nine of those 10 seasons, his team ranked in the bottom five in pass attempts. Now, he never had a passer like Justin Herbert, but I don't think he's going to completely, maybe maybe he does completely change his stripes. But if you'll remember last offseason, one of the things we heard about why Lamar Jackson was going to be so much more successful as a passer is because of how much better the passing game concepts were going to be than they were under Greg Roman. So I'm not even sure a, a bunch of pass attempts in his offense is a good thing. It's yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm working on 2024 projections this week because they're <laughs> the earliest are going to publish next week. Um, and I did the chargers last night and Justin Herbert was not a top 12 quarterback. Okay. How many touchdowns did you get? Uh, 24. That's the biggest fear for me is that he's not going to be able to come through with the 30 touchdown mark that we want to get out of our elite quarterbacks. And yeah. I, I, I'm feeling what Heath's feeling for sure. Jamie, well, also, you... I mean, personnel working against him too. You know, you have Keenan Allen in his early thirties, Mike Williams, if he's back coming off an ACL tear, Quentin Johnston, who we know had a rough rookie campaign, you know, no star at tight end and Austin Eckler may be out the door. Um, and if he's back, he's an elder statesman. Can he still do what he's capable of doing, catching the ball? I have a great question here. I'll get to this question in a second. I want to finish this Greg, this Greg Roman discussion here. Um, but the other part of that, you know, Justin Herbert's personnel isn't great, but neither is the idea of being a run-heavy team right now. I mean, so does that mean if they draft a running back that we're going to love whoever the Chargers have as their starting running back? If it's Eckler again, I don't. I can't imagine we're going to love him. You know they don't. They don't have a good running back. It doesn't look like right I now. I would not expect it will be Eckler again. I th I think I don't know that I'm going to love any of the running backs from this draft class, but there's a very good chance if the Chargers take a running back in round two, that is going to be my highly ranked, highest ranked rookie running back. Right, and there, you know, I mean, you have Josh Jacobs free, Saquon Barkley free, mm. you know, Joe Mixon potentially free. You know, Tony there, there, there are guys that could be on the move that could end up there, you know, you'd like it to potentially be one of those guys as opposed to, let's say a Devin Singletary type who's going to be fine, but just not chance to be maybe a superstar in this type of offense. Yeah. They're also in it's chargers are in salary cap hell right now. They do have to do some things to free up some money. All right. The question from Krana is between Adam Heath, Jamie and Dave at a Super Bowl party, who is the most likely to double dip? Not me. I think this is one I feel confident. Where I'm not the worst. The same here. Like I've already trained my children not to do it. I right. think it's it's probably me. I mean, <laughs> first off, like at a Super Bowl party, who is the most likely to maybe not have all their faculties? It's probably me. <laughs> Just for, forget basic decorum. It's probably me. Um, also, does it count as double dipping if you dip a different side of the chip than the one that you ate from? I think in public, yes, it does count. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question and a great answer because I do that at home, but right. I would never do that at someone's Super Bowl right. party. Well, that's the thing is the Super Bowl party is at my house. So like, if people, other, if people, other people are coming here. <laughs> other people attending or you're at somebody else's house where okay. they're not. You can't do it. Family. I will definitely double dip on Sunday. So my apologies in advance. And Bye. chips is probably a questionable one if you go the other side. Like you could do like carrots, you know, maybe other side because yeah. they're. A little bit, a little bit. But it's still so close to your mouth. Oh, I agree. You I agree. Need like one of those super long pretzel sticks where like that I'd be comfortable with, but like a normal sized carrot stick, you double dip that. Oh, it's too close to what you're breathing on. I was going to say Heath because I felt like he wouldn't care. Uh, and then if other people were double, I, had, I, I would not, would not bother me at all if other people were doing it. No, <laughs> yeah, and I'd like somebody fun. somebody takes a drink out of my drink, it's not going to bother me. <laughs> I'd throw a drink in their face if they did that. But all right, we yeah. got to take a break. We'll take a break. Come back with our greatest hits and our biggest misses from 2023. We will be right back on Fantasy Football today. Champs are still in it, headed to Vegas. We're going to go Dave, Heath, Jamie with the greatest hits. Dave, I asked you each for two. Dave, what were your two greatest hits 
from 2020. Well, it, it's the two you picked for me. I ended up sending you like a dozen hits and a dozen misses. And I just wanted you to pick the ones that you thought were best. So the first one was Nico Collins being on my deep sleeper list. Mm -hmm. And this is one where watching preseason games helped, helped me evaluate Nico Collins because I thought that he looked good. I, I thought Stroud looked okay. I thought Nico looked good. And I felt good about him being a, a number one type of receiver for Houston this year. And I thought he could improve. I never thought he'd be as good as he was. But I just I, I liked he had good enough speed. I love the way that he could turn back to the quarterback. He had good movement for a guy his size. And Stroud acquitted himself moderately well in the preseason. He wasn't my favorite sleeper. He was on the deep sleeper list, but he wasn't even the top wide receiver on the deep sleeper list. But he was on the list. And so I'm taking credit for that one, uh, that Nico was a was a hit. I, I was on, when you first sent this out, I was wondering, is this a individual greatest hits and biggest whiffs or like the show's greatest hits and biggest myths because there were some things mm -hmm. that we were you all were in on this one too we were i think we were all in agreement oh yeah like this was a this was an fft one, hit uh that, was, that, that i agree completely. like uh yeah. re, re, you know not deep sleepers just sleepers yeah, yeah. Know, like good, good job to you guys and i remember well that's one of dave's greatest hits uh we'll get to the other one in a second i, I remember you know well i didn't remember until i looked at my old notes but um, this is what I wrote about Nico Collins. Just put in his notes. Houston has been 30th in scoring in two straight seasons, uh, going you know going into 2023, and uh, they have uh, they averaged 214 passing yards per game each of the last two seasons. So the two Davis Mills seasons, basically Davis Mills and, and whoever else, uh, about 214 passing yards per game. And I said, have first round rookie quarterbacks averaged 215 passing yards per game? In the last five seasons, there had been 17 quarterbacks, and only six, of, only uh, 10 of the 17 averaged more than 214, but only six of the 17 averaged more than 224 passing yards per game. So this wasn't a good track record for rookie quarterbacks, even the first round picks. CJ Stroud averaged 278 yards per game or 274 yards per game. So that's, yeah, yeah it's 74. So that hey, was amazing. And Nico Collins was a, was a big part of that. He, he was like the poster child, third year receiver, you know, a guy that really hasn't done much, but you could see uh, a, a trajectory in the right direction. And he hit in his third season. Uh, Dave, what was your other greatest hit? That Ramondre Stevenson was a bust. Uh, Ramondre was on my bust list. I was nervous about his production when he was the feature guy in 2022. I also didn't love how he did against the AFC East in 2022 and what really ended up happening in 2023 was that he shared to a degree with Ezekiel Elliott didn't score a lot of touchdowns that whole Patriots offense was a mess the offensive line was a mess that was another factor for why I didn't like Ramondre Stevenson and he was he was on zero of my teams I was really nervous about him having uh, a, a big breakout type of year and now I don't know what his future is because it's a new coaching staff I'm certain that the offensive line is going to get better. How can it get worse in New England? But they could go and add a, a better running back in free agency or in the draft and relegate Ramondre to being a, a passing downs back or a number two running back. I, I'm nervous that he's never going to be able to hit the upside that we talked about him having back in August, but it was upside that I never thought he'd be able to realize anyway. So Ramondre is a pretty interesting player, I think. Yeah, if you look at his 11 healthy games, he left week 13 after 27% of the snaps. So getting rid of Azer statting that one, getting rid of that game. He played 11 healthy games, and he actually scored 13.2 or more PPR fantasy points in seven of 11 games. Uh, I think one of the problems with Ramondre is that he rarely he rarely had huge games. You know, he didn't didn't have a lot of great games, and he had four games out of 11 with 7.2 or fewer PPR fantasy points. Just absolutely terrible games. And those were his only games with fewer than three catches. Uh, so he was re relying on that, but he got him. And then he was actually kind of rolling at the end. Uh, and then he got hurt, well, at the end of his season, you know. But uh, I don't I don't really know what to say about Ramondre in terms of, in terms of what went wrong. He, You said it, Dave. He did share with Zeke a lot, but I also think he just wasn't nearly as good. He only averaged four yards per carry. I think he averaged five yards per carry. He averaged 4.6 and five in his first two, two years. And he just didn't get enough work to only average four yards per carry. He wasn't making any big plays. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, I mean, that 
Well, that was, and that was hard to project. He, he was one. Well, but I think the thing that we did project, I remember he was one of those guys who I had the tweets of guys who had seen as many targets as he had and been as bad in terms of yards per target generally saw a reduction in the number of their targets. And he did even on a per per game basis, see a reduction in the number of his targets, but also the yards per target remained awful. Like he's been below five yards per target two years in a row. And that's just, that could be quarterback play. That could be system, but it's just, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, now they got a new offensive coordinator, right? Hopefully they'll stop throwing to their running back so much, but they're yeah, gonna have to get some receivers first. True. Uh, is is Ramondre Stevenson a lesson in running backs on bad offenses? And I know we're going to yeah. talk about Miles Sanders too. I don't know if that's another. Uh, I mean, I, I say this all the time: bad offenses don't matter as much for running backs as they do for for wide receivers. But it matters. You have to be involved in the passing game, and he was, but not to the degree, I guess, that we wanted. Think about how Ezekiel Elliott's biggest games went down. How many of them were because he was an efficient runner? You know, there were a ton of games when he was the guy in New England where he was averaging under three and a half yards per carry. It was ugly, but he would catch the ball out of the backfield consistently enough when he was the feature back for the Patriots. I mentioned the offensive line. I didn't even talk about the quarterbacks. The quarterbacks were terrible. Just the offense in general was bad. It made it easy for opposing defenses to gang up on Ramondre. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Ramondre is a bad talent. I don't think he's that at all. He belongs in the National Football League. He was in a bad situation, and that certainly made it tougher on him to have a good rushing average, to have a great receiving average, to score a lot of touchdowns. This Patriots team, I, I don't know exactly how many weeks they went. They were barely inside the five-yard line, I think, yeah. like the first half of the year. Something like, I don't know, maybe like 10 snaps, something like that. I might be exaggerating just a little, but they just could not get the ball near the end zone, and that's a problem for any running back. Okay, Heath, you're up. Your greatest hits. Uh, they were, I think I, I should have sent you a list like Dave did and let you cho choose, but the two I chose were the waiver wire splurge on Trey McBride and Tank Dell being my most drafted rookie of 2023. And I think that the McBride one was a reminder that not all tight ends come out like Sam Laporta and are awesome their rookie year. Like, it's okay that a, a tight end with the pedigree that he had and the production that he had in college and didn't have a good first year. And then the combination of that with the scheme that we saw from this Cardinals offense when Zach Ertz was healthy, it was a complete reliance. They threw 32% of their passes this past season to tight ends. And McBride just picked right up on the volume where Ertz left off, but also was just a little bit better in terms of efficiency or a lot better, I guess in terms of yards per route run when it comes to that. I think that the more difficult thing with McBride is knowing what to do with him next year, because if you just project off what he did after he became the starter, after Ertz left, he would project as my number one tight end this coming year. 27% target share for him after Ertz got hurt. Um, I, I'm going to have him as a top three guy probably, and we'll see if they draft Marvin Harrison, how much that impacts it. For Tank Dell, I, I mentioned the Anatomy of series that we talked about on FFT Dynasty yesterday. One of the things that we are seeing is that these size requirements for both wide receivers and running back are not as important as they used to be. Used to be if you were a wide receiver under 180 pounds or under a certain height, we've seen Jalen Waddell and Devontae Smith and a lot of guys challenge those. And then Tank Dell just completely blew them up and was fantastic when he was healthy and on the field and uh, hopefully stays healthy for all of 2024. It's funny you mentioned that the, uh, the AFC Pro Bowl at Pro Bowl, the AFC squad lined up at one point. It was Tyree kill. Who was the other receiver? Tyree kill. Somebody small. I'm blanking on it. Um, and, and Keenan Allen, but Keenan Allen was in the slot and he was the biggest one of the three of them. Um, <laughs> Hmm. I'm trying to yeah. remember who the other receiver was. I pointed out to Zach. I was like, look, look how small the two outside guys are. Was Zay um, Flowers there somehow? No, it wasn't Flowers. Like as an alternate or something? No. Um, man, who was it? It'll come to me. Uh, maybe they, oh, Diggs. The Diggs is not big. Um, so it was Diggs and, and Tyree Kill and then Keenan Allen just like stood up above, above the, the three of them, uh, up, stood out among the three of them and just, you know, the two outside guys being little guys. And so, yeah, you're right. It's, um, it's certainly a trend that's that's going to work well for a few of these rookies coming into the league. 
Yeah. Well, so let's look at the wide receivers who were drafted in rounds, in round, mostly in round three of the NFL draft. I'll just include Marvin Mims. He was the last pick of round two. Mims, Tank Dell, Jalen Hyatt, Cedric Tillman, Josh Downs, Michael Wilson, Trey Tucker. So two, Dell, two, two big guys, like as far as the scale goes. I mean, height wise? Yeah. Okay. No, like, like they've got some girth to them. Okay. But yeah, I mean, from a fantasy standpoint, what, what made Tank Dell, <laughs> what made Tank Dell your favorite? Was it just the opportunity? It wasn't just the opportunity. I thought that he was a third round pick because of his size. And then he was being downgraded again when we got to rookie drafts because of his size. Um, I think if Tank Dell had been a couple inches taller and, and 20 pounds heavier, he would have been a first round pick. He was incredibly productive. And then I am a sucker and, and will remain a sucker after it, it working out this this year for a quarterback saying, please go draft that guy. Yes. I, I, I love it when college teammates get reunited, um, especially when it's the wide receiver coming after the quarterback. And CJ Stroud, there was all kinds of talk about how he wanted them to go get Tank Dell. And so I, that was that, that and the production, which I thought got overshadowed by the size, which is funny because Tank Dell's shadow is not very big. <laughs> the other thing is it's the opposite of what we talked about with Ramondre Stevenson. The Texans offense was awesome. They did a great job of utilizing Dell, and he turned out to be a really good route runner. If you go back and you watch him play, He's open a lot because he can run good routes. He was a master on those deep out routes that helped get the Texans in position late in games to score some points and to win games. I, I think that the fact that Bobby Slowick's going to be there again and nothing's really changing in a negative way in Houston, they'll upgrade their offensive line. Maybe they upgrade their run game a little bit. But I, I think the, the light is green for Tank Dell to pick up right where he left off, coming off of his injury. Nine games with Stroud and Nico, and he averaged 16.2 PPR points in those games. I think he could hit that number again next year. All right. Real quick, Stroud or Nico or, uh, Nico or Tank Dell, who you guys rank, ranked higher for next year? Dell. I believe I have Nico just a little bit ahead of Dell. I'm just going to change this answer. February, March, April, May, just every month I'll go with a different guy. I think that they're, they were back to back in my projections. I will go Nico right now, but we get to the tanks 100% healthy and, and looking good. Then I, I may go back to tank. All right, Jamie, you're up. Your greatest hits, Beastie Boys. Um, what I got right? Yeah. Oh, uh, avoiding 30 year old receivers. Uh, we've talked about this a, a, a lot already, but um, I was very anti these guys at this age. Um, and it worked out well with a couple and, and and burned me on a couple. So Mike Evans and Keenan Allen clearly did well in their 30-year-old seasons. Um, you know, great, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think well beyond the expectations of what we had hoped. Uh, but really, it was Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Those three in particular, I guess Adam Thielen did well too, but he wasn't really being drafted in the first, you know, three or four rounds. Um, but in terms of uh, Adams and Cup and Hopkins, um, you know, certainly once Cup got injured as well, you saw the red flags of what they could be: quarterback situation not being great, um, age showing some decline in, in in a couple of these cases. And so, uh, again, I'll probably stay with the same thing. You know, probably be wrong on a couple and and, and right on on a few as well. But this was something that I felt pretty confident in going into the season. Anything else? Your other greatest hit? Yeah, you know, I was looking at our magazine to see what we got right and what we got wrong, and um, th there are certainly some some of our bold predictions were funny. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I saw I just happened to, to flip through, and and Chris did a story. It was it was great and and well written on Chris Towers on um, taking quarterbacks early, and that still wasn't something that I was buying into last year, even as as successful as Mahomes and Hertz and Allen were, and and certainly the push to draft those guys early. It still wasn't something I was really comfortable doing and, and stayed away from and worked out well for me. Again, uh, I think we know how quarterbacks sort of unfolded last season. So um, more more taking a, a chance on some of the, you know, quarterbacks 10 through 12. Uh, had a lot of Dak Prescott, which worked out well. Um, situations like that, Tua, for a good portion of the season, you know, picking up C.J. Stroud and and, um, and Jordan Love uh, helped me win a couple of championships. So uh, I'll probably 
still go that route as always. I just want to see my interpretation of quarterback was that it like, okay, before I even say that, let me just give this stat in 2022, we had 12 quarterbacks, not counting Davis Webb and Sam Howell who played one game. We had 12 quarterbacks average 20 fantasy points per game, six point per passing touchdown. That was 2022 in 2023. We had eight. Uh, uh, no, wait, sorry, sorry. Nope, that's wrong. Uh, it was not sorting per game. We had, mm, what did I say, 12? Yeah. 14 or 15. I guess, okay, we did have more. I, I was going to say that my interpretation of the position was that it w- that part of why Jamie was right to wait on quarterback is because there were a lot of quarterbacks that emerged, but also the top guys weren't nearly as good as we thought. That's right. Do you agree with well, that? I almost put that in my wrong column um because i was drafting three of them in round two i still think if you drafted josh allen in round two you felt pretty good about it because of how bad the other top guys were um but yeah i mean mahomes was obviously a disappointment joe burrow got hurt justin herbert like it the guys that we took early mostly didn't live up to that cost yeah i mean no quarterback scored more than 26.2 fantasy points except per game except for carson wentz (laughs) 28 points in week 18 All right, let's take a break. Let's talk about our biggest misses when we come back. And we will be right back on FFT. The biggest event in sports is coming to the entertainment capital of the world. CBS Sports HQ will have you covered every minute leading up to Super Bowl 58. CBS Sports HQ at the Super Bowl. Getting you set with all the critical analysis you need. This league is decided by quarterbacks. He showed a lot of character in that moment. Great perspective, Joe Cena. It's the moment you've been waiting for all season long. Ready, set, face. Here we go. What do we get wrong? Our biggest misses from 2023. I'm going to go Jamie... Heath, Dave, Jamie's got a couple of running backs he wants to talk about here with his biggest misses of 2023. You're on the clock. Well, I'll start with the most obvious one for me was J.K. Dobbins not staying healthy. Um, you know, that was frustrating after he got off to a great start in his first game. Uh, but blowing out his, his Achilles, uh, feel feel terrible for him. Um, hopefully he'll be able to still get a job and, and, and perform well in, in the NFL. But I really thought it was going to be a breakout season for him. You know, everything was pointing in the right direction. Year two off of his ACL tear. Uh, offense, you know, I thought was going to have a successful season. I thought he'd be a little bit more involved in the passing game. But once again, unfortunately, he could not stay healthy. And so never got a chance to see what he could have become. And um, as you probably expect, ruined a few of my fantasy teams as well because I invested heavily in in, in J.K. Dobbins. But what do you think about that? How much does that make you avoid guys with the injury-prone label going forward? Or do you think it's just totally fluky? It's a little bit both. I mean, obviously, he's got a track record. You know, I was thinking about this because um, I have a father-son basketball league with uh, my my 11-year-old, and I took Joel Embiid in uh, the 30-deep league that uh, is, is pretty popular in the industry that I'm still lucky to be a part of. Um, so I haven't beaten both those leagues, and clearly there's a track record of, of his injuries. And I was thinking about this, like there's no way I could take him um, as a top three pick again. You know, I mean, he's still probably going to be a first-round pick based on his talent. But when you start to get these guys that just have this this stigma attached to them that they're always hurt and they just can't, unfortunately, stay healthy, especially when they've been with the same team over and over again. Is it the training staff? Is it them? You know, what's the issue? Is it soft tissue? Is it, you know, broken bones? You know, what's the what's the case? And so you just have to, I think, just understand that there are some guys that just, you know, can't stay healthy or at least can't stay healthy for a full season. And so in, in the case of uh, Dobbins, yes, I, I will avoid him at the cost or at least the expectations that I was putting on him. Uh, as we talked about in the draft yesterday, like I didn't like the Nick Chubb pick, for example. I don't think mm-hmm. he's going to be at his age um, the best running back in Cleveland for the majority of the season. Just feels tough to trust. So players like that I will certainly avoid, and that's why I was avoiding Brees Hall and Javante Williams this season because coming back from the ACL tear at the cost you had to pay for them to me was a little bit too high, specifically Hall. Now he turned out to be very good at the end of the season, uh, very special which, you know, just speaks to, I think, his talent. So there's going to be, you know, exceptions to the rule. There are exceptions to the 30-year-old receivers, like we just talked about, Mike Evans and Keenan Allen. So it's just a matter of, you know, sometimes you'll be right, sometimes you'll be wrong. Uh, But the premise is to avoid players like this or situations like this. And in this case, yes, uh, players that have multiple injuries, you know, just don't, at least for me, it won't be as uh, boastful as them having big seasons like I thought he was going to have. 
Oh, he was going to have a big season. I, I, I think, you know, you look at what Gus Edwards did, what Dobbins did, even though I don't think he was very efficient in that first game, but I think he was going to have a good season. I going to give you a, a round of applause. It was gutsy. Good job. Now, what about Bijan Robinson? That was another one of your misses uh, for everybody, but you had a pretty bold take on him. Yeah, it's the cover of our magazine um, that I thought he would be the best rookie running back ever. So he would uh, surpass in PPR Saquon Barkley and non-PPR Eric Dickerson. Uh, Dickerson, I believe, was 1983. Barkley was 2018 um, or 19, uh, one of those years. Um, and he caught, obviously, you know, fell fell well short of that. Thank you, Arthur Smith. Um, but in any event, um, yeah, I, not that Bijan was terrible, but he definitely did not live up to the expectations of even – not being the best rookie running back. He was behind Jameer Gibbs. Um, he was in, in a lot of ways a bust in his rookie season, you know, based on where he was drafted as a top six, seven overall pick. So he, uh, he unfortunately failed. I do love that Raheem Morris has already said, <laughs> I don't know if you saw the answer the other day. Um, what do you like about this team? And he said, Drake London and Bijan Robinson about this offense, Drake London and Bijan Robinson. Notably left out Kyle Pitts. Hey, well, well, what about the other um, guy? <laughs> right? but he did. He did specifically single out Drake London and Bijan Robinson. So hopefully, uh, the the new coaching staff there will feature their top talents, like we thought the previous coaching staff would. Okay. Yeah, you know, guys, I, were we all? Well, actually, I feel like Heath was probably the lowest. Where did you have Bijan, if you recall? Uh, one two turn. If yeah. I like, I think I still had him in a first round pick. Um, but it was in that 10 to 12 range probably. And like, he's awesome. And he's probably going to have one of those seasons that validates the things that Jamie said about him. Um, I think my concern was just Arthur Smith. Um, yeah. yeah. Said, but well said. <laughs> That's the lesson learned is Arthur Smith. <laughs> If I had told you before the season that the Falcons were going to lead the NFL in running back rushes per game and that Bijan would be fifth among running backs in targets per game, you would have taken Bijan Robinson in the first round, no questions asked. Those well, two- he did, and that, that was that was kind of the premise, was they led the NFL in rush attempts the previous year. Yes. Right. So yeah. like nothing really changed from an offensive philosophy standpoint. It's just that he didn't get a lot of the high-level touches that we wanted. He had the headache game, which factors into you know how he how he performed overall, which lowered his points per game, unfortunately. But um, in any event, look, he uh, he didn't live up to the expectations, and he certainly fell short of what my bull prediction was. Do any of these things make you excited about the Steelers' running backs for next year? Now well, that I, Arthur I think, Smith is the OC in Pittsburgh, I, I think the thing is 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 the cost for them is going to yeah. be fantastic. Yeah. You know, so what's your like? You know, I know Heath wasn't part of this draft, but like I got Najee Harris and I know it was super flex in round nine. Uh, Jalen Warren, I think, went later in round nine or in round 10. Uh, so let's just say it's round eight or round seven, you know, for those type of players and what they're still capable of doing. I mean, look, both those guys were were still good fantasy options. I, I know Najee was a bust based on where his cost was this past season. And, and I think his ADP settled in round three. So he didn't live up to a round three pick, but he still had a good fantasy season based on how he finished and Jalen Warren for the most part had a good fantasy season based on what the expectations was as everybody's favorite sleeper, you know, so you're looking at how those two guys ended up performing last year. And now you're putting Arthur Smith there. And while we can sit here and say he wasn't a good head coach, which he wasn't. And he had some questionable decisions as an offensive coordinator. He still had a couple of good seasons for the Titans turn Ryan Tannehill into a successful quarterback, had a good year, good, good start to the career for AJ Brown and clearly was great for Derrick Henry. So I think you're going to get some very quality games. Hopefully it's just not maddening where we can't figure out which of the two is going to be better on a week-to-week basis, which we had last year and a lot of times as well. But Najee Harris and Jalen Warren should be set up for some relative success. I don't know if you guys agree with this, but B. John Robinson, even if he had split carries the way that he did, if he had just gotten the goal line-ish work, I mean, the first nine games of the season, he had two carries inside the 10 yard line and no rushing touchdowns the last eight games of the season. That's when they really started to feature him a little bit more. He had 10 carries inside the 10 yard line. He had three rushing touchdowns. If he had just had that role the entire year, maybe he would have been kind of like, I don't think he would have been top two or three, but maybe one, two turn good. That was the big deal to me is that Algier came in at the goal line. So stupid. Frustrating. Oh, Okay, let's yeah. go to Heath. Heath, your biggest misses from uh, two of these guys I put in one group. We talked about them last week, so I'll be short. It's just Miles Sanders and and um, Alexander Madison. 
Now, it wasn't exactly the same thing, but it was mostly a, a workload projection type thing. With Madison, it was not about his talent. It was just that I mean, Minnesota gave him a contract, and he looked to be the only guy soon after Cam Akers was there, and then Ty Chandler was better. And Miles Sanders got the biggest contract for a running back, went to a place where all they could do was rave about how much they wanted to use him and throw to him, and it took like a month, and Chuba Hubbard was better. Um, so those guys were were huge, huge whiffs. Yeah, I you know I was thinking about this before the show. Uh, how many? I need to do some research on this. Running backs who change teams. It's not, be a bunch of them this year. It's not a it's great well. team. I feel you know it's. I don't really know what to say about why Miles Sanders, who's so good per carry, was so bad. I mean, I looked at it. Had a pretty tough schedule to start the year. Also, the offense, I mean, the offensive line is where you go, right? They were really bad. And he had the come offense from, in general. Yeah. He had come from a team that was pretty great offensive line, you know, for all four of his seasons. And mm -hmm. Carolina was, I mean, Aquanu is looks like a total bust. They just, they struggled. But, but several of the guys who were like top five or top 10 running backs this year were not on their original team. I mean, obviously, McCaffrey, Raheem mm -hmm. Mostert. Most of it I thought about, but he's at least got the same, you know, James system. Connor on a per game basis. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're 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 going with a couple of years now that they've been with their respective teams, though. They weren't the first year. That's right. Right, but they were good the first year there. I think at least uh, obviously McCaffrey was. No, I mean it's worth looking into. I think one of the things is for some running backs is they they play like the first part of their career with a team and then they change teams and they're not in their prime anymore. But well, I mean, like Swift had a good season. No, it wasn't, yeah. you know, what we hoped. I mean, you know, you go back the year before, Jamal Williams clearly was a touchdown machine, but, you know, in his first year in um, in Detroit, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a case-by-case -case basis. I think sometimes what we see, and this is, you know, usually something I, I tend to avoid. I can remember Dave and I having this argument, you know, 10 years ago about who was the guy that went either from Baltimore to Minnesota, Minnesota to Baltimore, and, and – Chester Taylor. Chester Taylor, right. Uh, and, and I was maybe, maybe it was Chester Taylor. It was, sure. it was somebody and, and your line was follow the money. And I was like, don't follow the money. It was, it was not a good, yeah, that's when I learned not to follow. The it, money. It, was, it was, it was, it was, it was certainly one of those things where, you know, you, you see these guys, they get overpaid for production that they may have had in a career season in a contract year. And then they don't go to the most favorable situations. Now I wasn't necessarily fearing Miles Sanders because I did think that as Heath alluded to, it was a favorable situation for him because we thought he was going to be more involved in the passing game. And so that was, I, I think the biggest thing. And, and you, you know, the, the clip that got circulated almost right before a lot of drafts happened was Frank Reich and, and the GM at the time, I'm, his name escaped me, um, Fitterer, uh, were, were saying, you know, you're, you, we're, we're, we're going to use you, you know, whatever, whatever the words were, but you know, Talk about the 50 catches in Philly, it, right? 50 yeah. catches, you know, so it felt like he was going to be in a good spot. Now I know Heath was very aggressive in how he was drafting him and he had a, you know, feeling about it. nothing wrong with that. Um, and, and, and it didn't work out, but I, I think you look at it and you say, okay, it's, it was set up for a, a great situation. And it wasn't like he got a monster deal to go play there. He just got the season. Now, we're going to probably see guys get maybe a little bit overpaid. You know, we could see the Chargers maybe overpaying if they figure out their cap situation for a Barkley or a Jacobs because they want to get that system going in the right direction. We could see the Giants maybe overpaying for somebody because they want to replace Saquon Barkley if they don't feel like the, the contract is right. And, and I don't mean like paying more than what Barkley's worth. It's just paying, you know, more than that player potentially is worth. But there's going to be a couple of those this offseason, and we're going to get enamored by it because it's – Josh Jacobs, he's only 25. He's going to, uh, you know, the, the Bengals or or whatever team, you know, to be part of this offense. I mean, look, David Montgomery had a good season yeah, last year. Went to that Detroit. was brought up in the chat. Montgomery was a, was a great one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was looking at DeMarco Murray. He changed from Dallas to Philadelphia, had a bad year with Philadelphia, but then he went to Tennessee and he had a bounce back year with Tennessee. LaShawn McCoy uh, wasn't great in his first year in Buffalo, was terrific in his second year in Buffalo. So I guess it's probably case by case. All right, uh, Heath, what was your other biggest miss? Uh, avoid, uh, Jamie kind of referenced it earlier. We, we were we were out on Javante Williams and Brees Hall because of the uh, first year after an ACL, and it did not. I mean, it it slowed Brees Hall down for about three weeks, if my memory is correct. But he finished the year as a top eight running back, both per game and for the season. 
this does not necessarily change my mind about this process. And I agree with what Jamie said about Nick Chubb. It more just changed my mind about Brees Hall. And I already thought he was great, but I think he is just one of those extreme outliers um, and a, a super elite athlete. And he proved that this year in a, in a terrible situation in his first year off of an ACL, he still finishes as a top eight running back everywhere. Yeah. What do you think about this nine game stretch he had? Because he ended up averaging four and a half yards per carry. It's pretty damn good. He had a nine game stretch where he averaged 2.5 yards per carry. His longest run in nine games, 99 carries, was 15 yards. Talking about Brees Hall. I don't know if you remember that, but it was it was I'm sure you do. But yes, I do remember. He, he was playing with one probably the worst quarterback situation in the NFL and one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. But I think what I'm asking is when you look at that and say, all right, um, maybe he was still not back to full form and you know, maybe we got a little lucky with him. I, I so, think it's see, I don't I think it's the opposite. Because like when he wasn't getting as much work early in the year was actually when he was breaking long carries. Yeah. Like he, we, I mean, week one, week what one. do you have? 127 yards on 10 carries week five. Like he had a hundred or something like that in that, in that game. Yeah. Average nine yards per carry against the chiefs, eight yards per carry against the Broncos. Like he was incredible early in the year. Yeah. Uh, all right, Brees Hall was, and Dave was on that. I mean, Dave was the high guy on Brees Hall, so mm -hmm. that's a hit for Top Dave. Pick. But what about those misses, Dave? What about your biggest misses? Well, you picked the misses for me just like you picked the hits for me, and I'm curious why you chose. Uh, maybe it's just the talking point of Trevor Lawrence. Uh, I projected him as a breakout, thought he'd be fantastic, and he ended up being terrible. Uh, I, I remember why I liked him. I remember that he finished – the 2022 regular season pretty strong right around 23 fantasy points per game in his last seven. And that includes having just one passing touchdown in his final three games. And I remember saying he had a ton of drops by his targets last year and he should have had even better numbers. And then what happened this year is a ton of drops by Calvin Ridley, uh, other players on the team, uh, including a bunch in the end zone. We talk about that every time we talk about the Jaguars passing game. You and know I what? That can I'm I just sorry. I was shocked by something. True media has Trevor Lawrence with one drop on end zone passes. And I just Yeah, I looked at red zone passes and on true they media. Didn't, they, they didn't drop two, them. They were just always standing out of bounds when they caught right, them. Right. That's true. <laughs> I think that's, that's what it ended up being was just like a bunch of BS going down where the receiver was either like fumbling the ball just a little bit or yeah, foot out of bounds, like he said. There were some overthrows, too. There was definitely an off-target rate that went along with Trevor Lawrence. I think it was around like 12%. It wasn't great. But he didn't take that step forward, and the offense wasn't that good either. We thought that this would be an offense that would evolve with the receivers, with Trevor Lawrence, and it didn't really do that. And I, I, I feel like there's some rumors that have come out about Ridley and, and what exactly happened to him this year. I don't know them. I didn't remember what I read about him, but I know that he obviously was not perfect when it came to being a top target for Trevor Lawrence. And this is going to make us all very nervous for Lawrence next year. I don't think any of us have him as a top 12 quarterback, and I don't think anybody would bat an eyelash at it. But I still can't help but think that he does have the potential to finish as a top 12 fantasy quarterback next year. Could be one of the quarterbacks that I don't mind taking a chance on late in drafts. I I think it really is a test of how much do you care about pedigree after a guy has played 50 games in the NFL. Yeah. I think it was easy going into last year. Not everybody felt this way. I mean, Heath obviously was the lower guy on, on Lawrence, but a lot of people felt this way. Forget about what happened in the Urban Meyer year. Mm -hmm. right. So if you treated his second season as if it were – not exactly a rookie season, but if you just looked at that season, you said that was encouraging. He came on strong late in the year. He was the number one pick. He was the best prospect since Andrew Luck for a lot of people. It made he added Calvin Ridley. Made sense to have the breakout. It never happened. 
I think the big number that jumps out to me is 22 touchdowns to 15 interceptions. That's just horrible. He did. Uh, that was the 17 game pace. Sorry. He played only 16 games. He was on pace for 360 rushing yards though, which is great. Jamie, what do you think happened with Trevor Lawrence? And the reason why I picked for Dave, it did give me a long list. I picked Lawrence and Tony Pollard. So I feel like those were industry wide, you know, uh, mistakes or misses rather, but Trevor Lawrence, Jamie, what's your thought on what went wrong for him? I mean, you guys hit on a lot of it. I, I, I think the offense was just really a, a failure as a whole. You know, I mean, there, there were some offensive line injuries that played a part in this. I mean, I, I just spoke to Evan Ingram at the Pro Bowl, and I said, what do you have to do, you know, personally to help Trevor get better? And he said, we have to protect him. You know, he said, and that includes the tight ends. You know, that's a big part of it, you know, was that he was constantly under under pressure. But, you know, Ingram talked about the personnel expecting to change. So I think that speaks to maybe the team expecting Ridley to move on, you know, if I had to you know, just read between the lines. But, um, I mean, look, you know, when you have three pass catchers and what we thought Travis Etienne could be as a pass catcher, you know, so four guys that should have elevated him um, coming off the year that he had, the way that he finished, because he was fantastic in that Chargers playoff game. You know, we all saw how, the, how he you know, brought that team back and really the way that he finished the, the season. But, um, you know, Heath has, has a great point there. You know, how much do you buy into pedigree? And so, the physical tools are certainly there. The weapons, I think, whether Ridley is there or not, I think you can still buy into him having enough around him to be successful. But he's got to prove it. You know, he's got to go out there and he's got to show it. And, you know, it, it felt as if, you know, and, and I spoke to some people who covered the Jaguars last offseason, and this is not a P. Prisco thing, this is other guys, that they were saying the schedule, the division, everything's set up for them to just have sort of like a runaway year. And I think that's why a lot of it is is a complete failure. I mean, they, they should have won this division – with their eyes closed. And I don't think anybody expected the Texans to be as good. That's clearly a, a, a second part of this. And, and the Colts had a much better season. Than a lot of people expected, especially after Anthony Richardson went down, but everything on that franchise took a step backward. And, you know, we may be looking at Doug Peterson gone after this season, if they don't make the playoffs and maybe make a significant playoff run. But uh, press Taylor was a, was a bad play caller or, or Peterson was a bad play caller. Whoever actually ended up calling plays. I don't think anybody ever knew. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done in Jacksonville and, and I, I'd like to see, you know, Lawrence play a little bit more free, throw the ball downfield a little bit more. You know, a lot of it felt like it was horizontal passes as opposed to, you know, vertical throws down the field. And maybe that was Zay Jones missing so much time because it felt like their offense was better when Jones was healthy. So we'll see. I, Adam, you, you mentioned the touchdowns and you should play the Adam, you were right clip, but yeah. I've got, do I have a list for you? Trevor Lawrence has thrown 1,750 passes in the NFL. He has a touchdown rate in his career of 3.3%. Oh. There oh. are 13 quarterbacks in NFL history who have thrown at least 1,750 passes with a touchdown rate of 3.3% or lower. Would you like to hear the list? Adam, you were right. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Mike Livingston, Mike Phipps, Jim Harbaugh, Rick Meyer, Rodney Pete. Tony Banks, Cordell Stewart, Joey Harrington, Kerry Collins, David Carr, Chad Henney, Trevor Lawrence, Daniel Jones. You're about to make every Trevor Lawrence dynasty league manager drive off the road. I don't think I knew the first two names on that list. Who were they? Mike Livingston and Mike Phipps. I think Mike Livingston might have been a Chiefs quarterback. Possibly. At some, he, he was his entire career a Chiefs quarterback. Ooh, all right. He, uh, he his last season was the year I was born, so I didn't I didn't actually see him play. Wait, Trevor Jim Harbaugh Lawrence. was a quarterback? <laughs> <laughs> Trevor Lawrence was eighth in pass attempts. He was 18th in red zone pass attempts, 21st in green zone pass attempts. That was another weird thing. They just didn't get near the end zone that much. Uh, and I also saw today Calvin Ridley led the NFL in end zone targets. How about that? Uh, he had 24 of them, and they just uh, no drops. I, I watched to all Media, 24 right? of them. What'd you say? No drops, according to True Media. Right? Uh, maybe one, but I actually watched all of them, and I would agree with that assessment. I, I would say he had no drops. He maybe had one, but it was really tough. I don't know. I, then I remember that one against the Ravens where he was totally inbounds, and they called it incomplete, and then they reviewed it, and then. They still called it incomplete. I believe it was John Perry was like, uh, I don't know what they're doing. He's inbounds. <laughs> Trevor Lawrence just couldn't catch a break. Um, all right, the other one was Tony Pollard, who was a huge bust. And another guy who he had a, 
He had the second most red zone carries and the sixth most carries inside the 10 yard line, the sixth most carries inside the five yard line amongst running backs, a couple quarterbacks who were ahead of him there. And he scored six touchdowns all season. And he was the number 23 running back per game in PPR, number 26 in non PPR. This is Tony Pollard. We're talking about Dave is the last one here. So finish with this whiff. I just thought Harbaugh was Screech's cousin and that was it. Um, Pollard, we, we, we kind of got hoodwinked by the stats. We we knew that he was elusive in 2022. He was top 15 that year in yards after contact per rush, explosive explosive play rate, uh, PFF's elusive rating. Like he was just tough to bring down on the limited diet of work that he had in 2022 in Dallas with Ezekiel Elliott. And I think we all just thought, okay, he's going to be able to do what he did last year that per, that year. 2022 and get end zone opportunities on top of it. And Adam, you just illustrated that he did. Yeah. He just didn't come through with them, but he really wasn't elusive at all. If you give me a minute, I will tell you just how unelusive he wound up being in 2022, but nowhere near the breakout candidate that I thought it would be. I thought he'd easily have double digit touchdowns, thought he'd have a shot at over 1500 total yards, not worth where we were taking him in drafts. Not even close. Is no. is he a word of caution when it comes to Devon Achan? Certainly, they're they're the ex, it's the exact same thing because what are we going to point to with Achan? You can't catch him; he's amazing. But like Achan, there's a question about, or like Pollard, there's a question about how much work Achan can actually have. The difference, though, is that I think that Achan can be if if if, the, if they if you told me before the season. He's never ever going to have a game with more than 15 touches. I would still be excited about him because of how explosive he ended up being last year, last season. Yeah. This past well, season. So he Pollard did say that the leg was an issue, that he wasn't fully held. That was kind of late in the season. Um, but do you think, you know, not to question his, his validity, but I always, you know, get concerned, you know, covering the league for as long as I have. When you hear guys that, are having bad seasons say that after the fact you know not not, that it's not justified but if he's having a great season like oh yeah yeah i'm doing this but you know my legs still bother me you know like those are always some 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 questionable takes see i'm always nervous when i hear about it before the season from that's before. different totally different yeah. it is different but like when they start making excuses before the games count i'm taking like three steps back from that player I'm I'm not really interested in drafting them. Uh 6% explosive rate for Tony Pollard in 2023 compared to 11.9 in 2022. So that was cut in half. His yards after contact per rush was down by a full yard. Uh, I don't know what his elusiveness rating is from PFF. It, it doesn't really matter. You you could see it with Pollard. He just wasn't yeah. nearly the same guy that he was the year before. And yeah. HN, you know, to to be fair, you know, you're going to have, I think, some injury concerns because of him struggling to stay healthy in his rookie campaign. But if they move on from Mostert, move on from Wilson, don't bring in anybody of significance, it's hard not to get excited about what he can become. I think it's 100% that there will be a split of running back duties in Miami. That's just what Mike McDaniel does. It's what all the 49ers or the Kyle Shanahan guys do, except when they've got a Christian McCaffrey. But it doesn't mean that he's going to be bad for fantasy. It might mean that he's not worth a top 15 pick, though. I am very interested to see what 2024 looks like for Tony Pollard, where he is, because he played on the franchise tag, what kind of role he has. Maybe he can just thrive in a smaller role again. I still I, I don't think the numbers were just nonsense. You know, his first four years, he was by the regular metrics, by the now, metrics, he was phenomenal. I think that first four years, like this is kind of a test also of do, is it is it total number of touches or is it age and a combination of injuries? Because he's pretty much to the age where it wouldn't be that surprising if he's, you know, he's 27 this year, right? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, 26, 27 is still a pretty good year for, for running. That's when back. the breakdowns start to come. Uh, I don't know. I, th I, I think 27, well, 28 is. 26 yeah. is not. Yeah, but yeah, he'll be 27. He hasn't had that much work, so that's the other factor in it. But I, I, you know, it, I, you, what do you think the chances are of Tony Pollard being the week one starting running back for the Cowboys? Twenty-five percent. 
I was gonna say 30, 35, yeah. Yep, right in that range. I think that's their that's offensively, that's their biggest upgrade. All right, we have a question here. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, what's the chance that he's a week one starting running back for somebody? See, like I could see it again, you know, if we're talking about the Chargers being in cap hell or some team doesn't want to pay for Barkley or Jacobs, like he's gonna be in that next tier free agents. Yeah. Uh, last question here before we go. It's from a, a viewer, Jaquan. Is Caleb Williams a better prospect than Trevor Lawrence? Asking because I don't watch college football and I'm genuinely curious. We had Emory Hunt on. He gave them the same grade, gave them a 90 grade. Uh, who but they're they different, do? right? So different. Yes. Um, I, he, Caleb Williams is not as much of what people would call a can't miss prospect, I don't think, as Lawrence was, is my perception. But he has some some attributes that are that are wildly more fun to to speculate on. What could be? He's smaller. Was he six one? Lawrence has that, you know, that height you love from your kind of prototypical franchise quarterback. Williams has a better arm. Would we say? He's got a freaking cannon. He makes ridiculous throws. I mean, they both have great arms. But uh, I just thought that was an interesting, interesting question because. Uh, Emory Hunt did mention he had the same grade on both of them, a 90, which is very, very high. All right. All right. You, want our, you want our bold predictions from the magazine? Yeah, but before you do that, before I forget, we have a mailbag tomorrow, so please send in your questions, fantasyfootball at cbsi.com. Go ahead. Oh, boy. Who remembers their bold predictions? Yeah, I'd like to remember. leave. Can I leave now? You want to finish the show without me? I thought, I thought, you, I thought yours was the best. You had, you, you're, you had one that was the best. You had two that were terrible. Um, oh, terrible. Here are your three, Adam. Jameer Gibbs will be a top five running back. That was pretty good. Boom. That's good. All right, now close yours. Uh, Jerry Judy will be a top, top five wide receiver. Oh. Close. On the Bron- I think I said on the Broncos. And yes, the editor- you, did. you said that Marvin out. Mims will be better. <laughs> Portland Sutton will be better. Uh, hold on, hold on. When were, when were these submitted? It was in June, right? These were submitted end of May, early June, yes. Okay, so Adam, I don't think – I'd give you credit that you wouldn't say that after Judy messed up his hamstring and – of course, that's true, yeah. training camp. That's true. Yeah, that was and then the- your final one was Marquise Brown will be a top 10 wide receiver. Yeah. Yeah, that's just crazy. I thought Kyler Murray was going to play in week one at that point. Like yeah. He had a seriously slow recovery from that injury. Or week one, week two, week three, something like that. I had not expected to be like week 10 or whatever. But did Marquise Brown still play some games with Kyler Murray? Oh, he? yeah, he was horrible. <laughs> yeah, he was All right, Heath, very similar to Adam. You had one great one and, and two stinkers. Oh, I had a good one? I don't remember that. <laughs> Your first one was Tua Tonga Vailoa plays 17 games and throws for 5,000 yards and 40 touchdowns. So you were okay. close. Close, yeah. But the NFL in passing. Uh, all right, cover yours. Um, Pat Fryermuth finishes the year as tight end three with 900 yards receiving and seven touchdowns. I'm going to be much less specific next year. Like, I need to stop <laughs> after the, way too specific. And then Jordan Addison and Justin, Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison are the first duo since Antonio Brown and Juju to both top 100 catches and 1,000 yards. Well, not bad. How far off were you on that one? Well, I mean, I guess you were off a lot because of Jefferson. Yeah. Well, Let's Addison see. didn't do it either. All right, let me just see the up through the Green Bay game what Jordan Addison was on pace for. That's when. Go ahead. You can read. Uh, it was like twelve something. That's when Kirk Cousins got hurt. Right. So this may not have been such a bad. All right, I got you right now. He was on pace for only seventy six catches, but a thousand twenty four yards and fifteen touchdowns. But some of those games were without Jefferson. Jefferson got hurt in the Bears game, I want to say. Yes. So that would have been two. All right, so I'll do just the first six games. We know Jefferson would have hit that pace. Uh, yeah, Addison was on pace for 60, 62 catches, 785 yards, 11 touchdowns. He averaged 12.4 PPR points per game in the first five games with Cousins and Jefferson. His next three games without Jefferson but with Cousins, 21.5 PPR points per game. Mega right. stuff. I screwed 9. that up. 9.9 PPR points per game after that. I did six games instead of five. Anyway, go ahead uh, to Dave's. Um, Dave's, okay. Dave's was pretty good. Uh, Aaron Jones will not finish as a top 20 fantasy running back. Where do you finish? I would well, definitely outside the top 20 in total points. I don't know where he was. In oh, yeah. Game. No question in total points. But who cares about total points? Uh, 28th in PPR per game. That felt that I would have never guessed that low. Um, Calvin Ridley will be a top five fantasy wide receiver. Nailed it. And then this one is hedging a little bit because there's really only one other player that would fall into this category. So you were right, but 
You had the only New York Giant where the top 150 pick is Saquon Barkley. I believe the only other player going in the top 150 was Darren Waller. So, yeah, that's why I said that. <laughs> so basically, basically just said Darren Waller's going to be bust. <laughs> yeah. That was Daniel, a good Jones, Daniel Jones wasn't a top 150 pick? Uh, maybe, but if he was based on ADP, just barely. Okay. All and right, Jamie. Uh, hey, what were your... You know Ridley finished ahead of Kirk in PPR points per game. Did he? By a full PPR point. But both I, of bet, I bet if we Azer stat that, he did not. <laughs> what does that mean? Because Kirk got hurt in like the well, first Well, no, it's five. per game. It's not based on seven. I didn't take their total numbers in the I know. five by 17. No, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm going to take out that game that he didn't You finish. take out the Kirk game that he left with an injury, although it was on a pretty big play, as I recall. Uh, I, I bet Kirk averaged more, but I don't know. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, my three are terrible. Uh, Anthony Richardson will become the second quarterback all time to pass for 3,000 yards and rush for 1,000 yards. May have done it, but he, he that was a decent one. He had a shot. Um, another Calvin Ridley one. Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk will be the best wide receiver duo in the NFL. No, they were not. And then uh, Ramondre Stevenson will have the best PPR season for running back in Patriots history. So it would have been better than Curtis Martin's best season, which was not close. Who was the best? Oh, I guess it was, it was, no. Who was the best wide receiver duo? The best wide receiver duo? Yeah. Total Probably points. Hill and Waddle still. Could have been I would Hill and Waddle still. No, I think I'm going to go with uh, Brown and Smith. I'm going to go yeah. with the Eagles guys. Where's what about Nico good? and Tank? Ooh, that's a good one. No, they we, missed two games. Or we, the well, week the week before Christian Kirk got hurt, he was averaging thirteen point eight, and Kirk Ridley was averaging twelve point six. Okay, uh, AJ Brown averaged seventeen point three, and Devontae Smith fourteen point four. Oh, you know what? Maybe it was Debo and IU. No, nah, I think it was probably the Eagles. Are, why? I don't understand. Devontae Smith only averaged one point more than Jalen Waddle. Did he? Uh, Tyreek well, Hill averaged. Five points more than AJ Brown. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, well, okay, because I was doing overall. But if you want, you can Debo were both finish in the top sixteen in PPR points per game among wide receivers. Okay, per game, it's definitely the Dolphins guys. No, it's not. It's the 49ers guys. Why would I? Oh, Ayuk's nine not. points behind Tyree Kill. No, it's oh per game. Tyree Kill averaged twenty three point seven. Jalen Waddle averaged fourteen point two. Oh, you're combining the two. Yeah. I don't know. That's one way to do it. It sounds like a loser way to do it. <laughs> what, way it way? what? What way are you doing it, Dave? Uh, just where they finished among receivers in PPR points per game. So you're going for the highest. They were number, the highest two. duo. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. But I would say that since Devontae Smith was just barely behind those guys. Uh, that's total points. All right, I'm getting all confused. It was Thielen and Mingo. We'll be back Probably tomorrow. Sky Moore and Kadarius Tony. Yeah, we'll be back tomorrow <laughs> with another episode. How of far Fantasy. behind were uh, Puka and Cup? I thought about that, too. Cup was, let's Cup see. Cup was only around like 13 PPR points per game. Yeah, 13 and a half. Nico and Tank were both top 18. Oh, Nico and Tank were really. They were really, really good. And then Devontae and AJ Brown were both top 20. And Jalen Waddle was 21st in PPR points per game, if you can believe that. Wait, what would Jefferson? Jefferson 20 plus Addison. Jefferson and Addison were up there, too. That was 33 points per game. Goodbye, everybody.